Last week we focused almost exclusively on the older brother and how he arrives first. That those outside of the covenant, at least in the Old Testament, get their earthly kingdoms before the early brothers do, or before the younger brothers do. And that, as Matthew Henry says, those that look for great things from God must be content to wait for him. This week, we will focus on Esau's marriages almost exclusively and the fruits of those unlawful marriages. So uh, we'll, we'll go through here um, and kind of look at the specific wives, kind of look at their names and, and where they descended from. And then we'll move on to uh, what the Bible uh, as a whole has to say about these kinds of things. In our passage, probably the most relevant aspect for, for what we're going to talk about today is that Esau marries daughters of Canaan. That's what we're told. They're daughters of Canaan. One of these daughters of Canaan is named Adah, which means ornament. Uh, a lot of the wives have names like ornament or perfume or spice. One of them is high places. Um, they have names which suggest um, that they may have been temple prostitutes. We don't know, but it's kind of harlotry type language. It can be good, these are good things, but the way that um, we have extra biblical evidence and the way uh, that the, the Canaanite women uh, uh, are portrayed in scripture suggests that this is the case. So her name's Ada, which means ornament. She was the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Elon means terebinth or mighty. And then uh, the Hittites descend from Het, who was a son of Canaan, the Hettites, the Hittites. Uh, Heth is how we would say it. Um, so she's from, she's from Canaan's line. He's marrying uh, this daughter of Elon Mighty, and uh, um, Het means terror. He's marrying this daughter of this ornament of mighty terror. The, the, these are the, the names that are involved here. Another wife is a holy bama, which means uh, a tent, my tent of the high place. Uh, so again, high places are where you go to worship God, and uh, the Canaanites are worshiping different gods. So she is named after this, this uh, place of worship to other gods. And uh, her, she, we're told she's the daughter of um, Ana, which means answer, and she's the daughter of Zibion, which means colored, um, and Zibion was a Hivite. And the Hivites, uh, if you remember from uh, two chapters previous, those are the people who live in Shechem. Hivite probably means villagers. The Hivites were the Shechemites. They, they, uh, Hamor descends from a Hivite, uh, which we will get to later. But they're all, the Hivites descend from Canaan. So again, we have Canaanites. We have daughters of Canaan that Esau's marrying into. Then we get to the third wife. Her name is Basemot or, or Base Math. If we're to American, Americanize it, Base Math or Basemot. And that means spice or perfume. So again, um, we have these kinds of connotations involved here. She, we're told, is Ishmael's daughter. Now, sometimes the extra biblical rabbinical uh, literature, they uh, speculate. There's all kinds of speculation going on in the Talmud and, and all these things. One of the things that they speculate is that Esau was trying to win his father's favor by marrying closer to the family line. So he marries these, these daughters that are Hittites, and he's trying to win uh, uh, his father's approval. We don't know, but uh, it is interesting. Um, but she's Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabaioth, which means heights. Again, we have high places. We have, it, means, it, means, it means heights. Um, now, uh, it's worth noticing that Basemot, this daughter of Ishmael, is called a daughter of Canaan. So she's literally descended from Shem. But if we're to trace it through her father, because she comes from Abraham, but Moses says, here's a daughter of Canaan. Now, it could mean she's uh, a daughter of the land of Canaan, since Esau is acquiring these women while he's in the land of Canaan. Could be that she's a spiritual daughter of Canaan because they're outside of the covenant. Um, in any case, we have this association with Canaan with an Ishmaelite daughter, right? The, the, the second generation after Abraham that they're outside of the covenant. Here's a daughter of Canaan. Um, 
Now, all of these are associated with Canaan. Noah says to Canaan, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brethren. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. May Canaan be his servant. So Esau is marrying into this cursed line. He's marrying into a people who are outside of uh, the covenant. And um, in Genesis 26, we're also told about Esau's wives, not Basemot, not the, uh, the Ishmaelite, um, but a different Basemot, which we'll get to in a second. And they're both the Hittite ones. And we're told that they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Some translations say uh, they vexed the souls of his parents. They were a vexation of the soul. These were not good women. <laughs> These were bad women. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wives Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basemot, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. That's Genesis 26. So you might notice these are different than the wives we read in uh, Genesis. Uh, that was Genesis 26. There's some differences here than with the wives of Genesis uh, 36. And it gets confusing, and so I'm going to bypass everything I wrote down and just say, basically what happens, what's likely going on here, is that it's the same woman with two different names, essentially. So uh, you have Yudit, which means praised. Uh, she's the daughter of Beeri. So she could be a fourth wife. But it's also likely that she's um, a holy bama in, the, in Genesis 36. And that the, the record of descent is different. In Genesis 26, we get her father's lineage. So she's the daughter of Beeri the Hittite. And in Genesis 36, we get she's the daughter of the daughter of a Hivite. So we're getting the mother's lineage in Genesis 36. And I think it goes out of its way to mention the Hivite heritage because it connects to Shechem, which we'll get to uh, later. So you, Judith and Aholibama are likely the same person. Um, so, it, so her name means praise and my tent in the high place. Again, it's these worship names that she's, she's getting. But both of those lines go back to Canaan. So I'm, I'm throwing this out here because oftentimes in an unbelieving world, we have people who are like, the scripture contradicts, and so I'm just showing you some harmonization here um, with uh, uh, internal to the biblical literature. We can harmonize it. And then also the extra biblical rabbinical literature says the same thing. These are the same women, two different names. Uh, and then we have the same thing with um, Basemot, which that gets even more confusing. But in Genesis, uh, let's see here. Because Basemot is a daughter of Ishmael, but then uh, in Genesis 36, uh, Basemot is a, uh, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, or maybe it's vice versa. But anyway, it's the same thing. So he has two wives named, named Basemot, uh, but, but uh, one of them has two names, and it's, uh, they're both the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Uh, Ada and Basemot are likely the same person. So her name is a, is a combination of ornament and perfume and spices. So possibly this kind of temple prostitute type thing. Again, extra biblical literature kind of affirming this. OK. Um, so these women uh, are a grief of mine to Esau's parents. Rebecca says to Isaac in Genesis 27, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Het, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? This is like, this is a high language that uh, Rebecca is, is saying. She is uh, marrying a good woman, a faithful wife is, is top priority that Rebecca has for Jacob. And she says this, now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Listen to my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Right? Flee. Which this, I think this foreshadows Joseph fleeing other women. Joseph flees Pharaoh's wife. Jacob is fleeing the, land, the women of the land. Uh, unlike Esau, Jacob takes wives who are not from uh, the land. He obeys the voice of his mother. Uh, which we can also typologically consider. 
um, as, as the Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. The church is, is our mother. And she tells us certain things about who we should marry. Um, so Esau is marrying. Esau gives up his inheritance, and then he marries women who, who have given up their inheritance. Jacob's wives come back with him to the promised land. Uh, Esau's wives leave with Esau to Edom. Jacob's wives follow Jacob in covenanting and worshiping the true God. Esau's wives followed Esau in his rebellion and exile from the land. Or we might say that Esau followed his wives and, and their gods, followed them outside of the land. And they're covenant breaking. Jacob listens to the voice of his mother. Esau listens to the voice of his wives. Okay, um, so yeah, if we're to be like Jacob, we ought to listen to the voice of our mother as well. And if that contradicts the voice of our father, we listen to our heavenly father, of course. So what do our heavenly parents say about marriage? This, this is... Uh, this is all throughout scripture, which we'll get to in a second. But with this particular, I want to, now I want to tie it to the Shechem thing, the Hivites. In Deuteronomy 22, we've talked about this before. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Paul appropriates this language. This is unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked. Don't join yourself with uh, unbelievers. Uh, what does light have to do with darkness? And, and we most often apply this to marriage, although it doesn't seem that Paul is exclusively concerned with this. It actually kind of appears more in a worshiping context. But these things, again, are not mutually exclusive. These are, very, these are things that are very closely tied together. And this likely does go back to marriage. The law in Deuteronomy likely goes back to uh, the incident in Shechem, where Hamor is Shechem's father. He descends from the Hivites. Hamor means what? Mm-mm. -mm. Uh, Shechem means shoulder, which sometimes can mean strength. That might be what you're thinking. Donkey. It means donkey, right? And 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 uh, an ox is Israel. Uh, uh, oxen hold up the 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 sea uh, outside the temple, uh, where baptisms take place, and um, you can't yoke these things together. And remember, Shechem was willing to become an ox because he was willing to be circumcised. Yeah. And that's the problem with being unequally yoked. You either both become a donkey or you both become an ox. And, and, and Shechem was willing to become an ox. But what Esau does is he becomes a donkey. And his children become pastors of donkeys, right? Um, so that's, that is uh, uh, kind of what's going on there. I think that's why the Hivite descent is mentioned with one of the daughters here, that, the daughters of Canaan that uh, Moses mentions. That's right. That's right. Where does it say that? It's when uh, at the well. It's, okay, it's when Hagar. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, when Hagar is sent out, God, God makes these promises to her, and he says that Ishmael's going to be a wild donkey of a man. There's donkey language associated. Yeah. Okay, um, so marrying outside of the covenant is something the people of God are repeatedly warned against. And we kind of have the nascent aspects of it here. And it's all over the place in Scripture. And I want to spend the rest of the time, and it's, it's going to be longer than usual, so I'm just giving you a heads up. But I think, I, I'm, I think it's worth it. Because liberals are often, or, or ex-evangelicals, whatever kind of faddish apostasy is happening now, always are like, conservatives are obsessed with sex. And it's not, it's not like this is like a preference. This is like in scripture. This is what God has his attention on. Marriage is important. And marrying a certain kind of way is important. Mm -hmm. And so going all through scripture and seeing these things and, and the mistakes that Esau made, we can learn from and avoid going forward. So I want to go all the way back, do a brief survey, essentially. Go all the way back to Genesis 6. What happens? The sons of God marry the daughters of men. And this uh, can be understood as the daughters of Seth or, or, or the sons of Seth marrying the daughters of Cain. 
That's Augustine's reading. Or it could be the sons of God being some kind of celestial fallen being marrying into human women. That's the, the first century Jewish way of reading it. That's how I would understand it. And then you have virtually every other uh, civilization, ancient civil, civilization corroborating this story in some form in, in their myths. Myths are based on reality in some sense. And, um, but it, I, I would say it doesn't matter. In any case, what's going on there is some kind of unlawful marriage. And what happens with the children? It's the same thing as the Edomites. The children of these unlawful marriages are great men of renown. They're the giants. They're the Nephilim. But so the kingdom grows up quick. You have these great men. But then it gets wiped out in the flood. These are the children who God, God destroys all of them, except Noah and his family. So we have this unlawful union, unlawful marriage thing right there in Genesis 6. And then we move on. Abraham takes Hagar. Hagar is an Egyptian as a concubine. It's an unlawful, unlawful marriage. Births Ishmael. It's a wild donkey of a man. You have this, you have this quit. He has 12 prince sons. And then they're enemies of Israel. They become enemies of God. This kind of breach of the covenant births enemies of God. We also have a threat. We have uh, Sarah and Rebecca are threatened with unlawful unions by Pharaoh and Abimelech. But God spares them. God protects them. And then we get to uh, uh, Esau, and he's marrying these daughters of Canaan outside of the land. Then we get to Joseph, as we mentioned. He's a son of God, and he successfully resists this daughter of men. If we move to Exodus, the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, and they're warned by God not to intermarry because it results in apostasy. If we read Exodus 34, uh, it reads as follows. Take heed to yourselves, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. So this is worship, right? Covenant is involved. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, uh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifices to their gods. And one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. It's a lengthy way of stating it. But this is scorched earth warfare. You need to destroy everything and don't intermarry with them. God is a jealous God. In Deuteronomy, the law is reiterated. It's expounded upon again. When the Lord your God delivers them over, over to you, so the victory is promised. We're getting into post-millennial dominion stuff here. You shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them. We're getting even more explicit. You shall not give your daughters to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. And we saw this play out. Where did this play out before they had entered the land? I know what happened. I don't know what, what happened. Tell me. Um, I'm pretty Yeah, I think you're. I think you're getting close to it. They, they, they have these uh, uh, women from the land come in, the, uh, and and they, um, they unite themselves with them, and they and they have uh, they start committing idolatry, and then Phineas he comes along and he kills them while they're in these unlawful relationships with them. That's right, and then they go and kill them later. Very good. I think I think you got that. That's Peor. That's, that's the heresy of Peor. And who's the one who fomented that was Balaam. And Balaam was likely a king of Edom. But we'll get into that next week. So I think that that's interesting as well. Um, uh, so we have this happening before they go into the land. 
and um, they're warned about it before they go. And then they conquer the land and there's still these remnants around. And Joshua reminds them once again, Joshua says this, therefore take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them and go into them and they to you, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord has given you. Unlawful marriages hinder postmillennial dominion. <laughs> and postmillennialists don't understand this. They only understand it in its most basic sense, which is, of course, Christians don't marry non-believers. We understand that, although some, some Christians don't understand that. We've had people in our own family who, are, who have allowed their sons to marry non-Christians. So there are aspects of the church who are even missing this at its most basic level. The liberals are pushing marrying uh, at a homosexual level, which is certainly way, way outside the scope. But postmillennialists are, are one of the serious um, violators of marrying outside of the covenant and hindering their own enthusiasm. Their, their enthusiasm for postmillennialism isn't going to make postmillennial dominion happen. And they are the biggest obstacle. They themselves are the biggest obstacle to, to this. And we'll, we'll get to what that is. I bet you guys are scratching your head. What is, what is this? What, what, is he, what is he leading up to? We see that in the time of the judges, Samson loves a Philistine, Delilah. And, and there's the same language used. Uh, she wants to know what, is, what, is, what gives him his strength. And she nags him and gives him so many questions. We have this phrase that she vexed his soul to death. It's the same thing that these daughters of the Hittites, Esau's wives are doing to his parents. Delilah does to Samson. He's like, all right, I'll tell you. And she treacherously betrays him, gives him over to the Philistines. She whittles this Superman down to this little nub, and then she betrays him. And then he does die. If we read in the Proverbs, Solomon's overarching wisdom to his son is marry a good woman. Seek wisdom. Wisdom is personified in the good wife. Folly is personified in the adulterous woman, the covenant-breaking woman. And yet Solomon himself, at the height of his kingdom, his heart is turned away from God because he marries outside of the covenant. He marries these foreign women. He sets up places of worship to their gods. It's amazing. It's amazing. You get, you get to heaven and Solomon's like, yeah, I know. I, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. God becomes angry with Solomon for being a covenant breaker. And he says, I'm, I'm going to take, take away the kingdom from you. And he, and he does. He takes away the kingdom from him. In the madness of the divided kingdom, we have Ahab marrying Jezebel. She's this, like, she's this priestess, witch, murderer, sorceress, harlot, a woman outside the covenant. And through her, she, she Ahab, and her cause Israel to sin. And then what happens to their children? Unlawful marriage. Their children are destroyed by Jehu. Their whole house is annihilated. And then we get to post-exilic Israel. Israel is taken into captivity. They return. And then God raises up Ezra and Nehemiah to call Israel to repentance. Israel had married these foreign women, and they brought them back. And it wasn't just the people. It was many of the priests. It was much of the leadership. The leaders of the church had broken covenant with God by marrying those outside of the covenant, marrying daughters of Canaan, so to speak. Ezra hears about this. He tears his clothes. He plucks his hair out. He plucks parts of his beard out, and he sits down astonished. When Nehemiah hears about this, he goes up to those who are in unlawful marriages. He curses them. He punches them, he pulls out their hair, and he forces them to repent and to make an oath to God. 
How's that for pastoral? Ezra seeks the Lord earnestly and intensely in prayer when he, when, when he hears about this. He's like, what do I do? And, and then it's, it's, it's amazing. I had never picked up on this before. A large, ascent, while he's praying, while he's praying, he's weeping, he's confessing, he's bowing down before the house of the Lord. And then a large assembly of people, they come to him of Israel, they come to him, and, and, and most of the elders, if not all of the elders, they come to him. And Shechaniah kind of speaks for the elders, and he approaches Ezra, and he says, we have sinned by marrying these women of the land. It's really remarkable. And the elders come to him, and, and he says, uh, but there's hope, because they understand that, that God is angry with them. And Shechaniah says, there's hope. And what's the hope? What, what, is, what do you think Shechaniah thinks the hope is found in? Anybody? Repentance. repentance. Exactly. That Israel should repent by separating themselves from these unlawful marriages. And, and what he, the way he says it, it's interesting because Ezra doesn't repeat this, but he says they should separate themselves from their wives and from the children that came from these wives. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty intense. And then they should renew covenant with God. And Shechaniah, he comes along as this like, he's, he says to Ezra, this is your responsibility. He's, he's saying to Ezra, this is your responsibility. He's speaking to the prophet. He understands this is your responsibility as a prophet. And he says, the elders are with you. Speak to the people. The elders are with you. May God give us more elders like Shechaniah. Shechaniah says, be of good courage and do it. He's reiterating the language that was spoken to Joshua before he takes the land because he understands this is about taking the land. It's all connected. It's all about taking the land. So they issue a decree that everyone in these unlawful marriages need to come to Jerusalem. They have three days to do it. And then if they don't come to, they, they don't come to Jerusalem, publicly repent and separate, their property will be confiscated and they will be removed from the assembly of Israel. Separated from the assembly. This is Ezra 9 and 10. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan wives. Then all of the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, But what about grace? <laughs> Then all of the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, what about the children? What about the exception clause? What about Deuteronomy 24? What about, what about, what about? They didn't say any of that. This is what they said. They said, yes, as you have said, so we must do. May the Lord grant us more people ready to repent in this kind of a way. Amen. And the people understood. They concluded. I think this is uh, from the voice of Shechem, actually, but or um, Shechaniah. They said that they should repent until the fierce wrath of God was turned away. They understood that these unlawful marriages were bringing the fierce wrath of God on them, and that repenting of them was going to turn it away at some point. In Nehemiah 13, we read a similar account. Um, but they, it's after they read the book of Moses. They're reading the book of Moses, and then they separated the, the mixed assembly, or the, the, yeah, the mixed assembly from Israel. And then we get to Malachi, and we come back to Jacob and Esau again. This is how Malachi begins, right? The Lord says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And he says, I've destroyed Edom. It's said in some kind of po poetic way, but he's like turned it into a den of jackals or something like this. And that's what the book of Obadiah is about. Obadiah is God destroying Edom. The children of these unlawful marriages, 
God destroys them. They become enemies of God. God destroys them. Through the prophet Malachi, he's saying, I love Jacob. I hate Edom. And I've destroyed him. I've destroyed Edom. And then the Edomites say, much like many post-millennials say today, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Fight and build swords and shovels in Edomite marriages. We will, build the desolate, we will build the desolate places with our classical education and psalm singing and Edomite marriages. It's not going to happen. God says, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called a territory of wickedness. The Lord continues, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? These people think that they're faithful conservatives, completely oblivious to how much God can't stand them. God says they offer polluted offerings. They offer tainted sacrifices. So God will not accept their sacrifices anymore. That's what he says. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Again, covenant is brought in again. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. We see these, these false covenant marriages. What do they produce? They don't produce godly offspring. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed of your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not dear, deal treacherously. And so we end the conclusion of the Old Testament canon. And here we are in the New Covenant with pastors and presidents of colleges who know a, bit, uh, a thing or two about Hebrew. And they read this and they conclude that actually we can divorce and we can remarry. And they preach this from the pulpit. They're doing the exact same thing that Esau did. They're marrying outside of the covenant. <coughs> Jesus says that if you marry a divorced woman, you commit adultery. If you divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery. Sure. We have the law. We have the law of Christ right there and we form these uh, theologies that allow us to be Edomites, allow us to do what Esau did, marrying these daughters of Canaan, justifying the marriages of the daughters to Canaan. So we find ourselves in a similar situation to Ezra and Nehemiah, except everything is reversed. Everything is stood on its head. Instead of the elders coming to the prophet and voicing their solidarity with him, they come to the prophets now. They mock them. They, anathema, they anathematize them. Instead of the, 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 the prophet saying, repent, repent to these people in unlawful marriages, what do the prophets say now? The false prophets. Grace, grace, when there is no grace. It's just one clown world parade of pastors and, and prophets and priests with these telephone poles in their eyes telling, their, telling the world to repent when there's these high places in their own churches. Instead of the people in, in Nehemiah and Ezra's time hearing the law, hearing God's word, hearing the voice of the prophets and repenting, so, so have you said, may, it, may we do it? They form these, they've been enabled. They've been catechized well. These people have learned the catechism from their pastors. I know what Romans says. There's no condemnation in Christ. So I can do whatever I want. 
Doesn't matter. And what's been the result? What's been the result of these marriages that are outside of the covenant? These covenant-breaking marriages, it's the same as Edom. They've apostasy. Their children have become enemies of God. That's the fruit. fruit it's, that's the fruit of their wisdom. Wisdom is justified by your children. So our leaders haven't learned the lesson of Edom. They want marriages like the other nations. They want the wealth and prosperity and the acceptable sacrifices of the temple without the pure hearts and without the pure hands. And it's they who have once again brought God's wrath on us, like God's wrath came on Edom or Israel when they married in these kinds of unlawful ways. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The lesson of Esau is to avoid the daughters of Canaan. For us, it means that if you're a Christian, you find another faithful Christian to marry. For us, it means the, the very like basic kind of like preschool level like uh, doctrine that conservatives do understand is that a man has to marry a woman. Yes, true, very good. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Jesus says you can't marry a divorced woman and you can't divorce your wife and marry another woman. It's very simple. These are ways of breaking the covenant. These are ways of marrying outside of the covenant. And if you do this, you're counting yourself unworthy of salvation. You are not going to inherit the kingdom because no adulterer will inherit the kingdom. Not only are you forfeiting your own personal salvation, you're bringing curses on yourself, you're bringing curses on your family, you're bringing curses into Israel, and you're bringing curses onto the nation as a whole. That's right. In Paul's discourse on election, he employs Malachi's words. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And if you're in, if you're marrying like Esau, you are in this adversarial relationship with God. You are opting out of your election. You are giving up your inheritance. And all the theology dorks out there will say, I was talking about Christians and Jews. Yeah, that's true. And he, what is Paul doing? He's saying the non-believing Jews are acting like Esau. That's what he's saying. And so what we're saying is that the non-believing Christians are now acting like the Jews. So stop acting like a Jew. Amen. If you're divorced and remarried, the, the spirit of Ezra is calling you to repent and separate. So let us be done with the curses of Esau, the fledgling kingdom of Edom, and let us embrace the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the greater Jacob, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. The charge is this. Listen to your father and your mother. Listen to the voice of Mother Church, and more importantly, listen to the voice of your heavenly father. And what do our heavenly parents tell us to do? Do not give your daughters to Canaan. Do not let your sons marry the daughters of Canaan. Do not take the daughters of Canaan for yourselves. Put away the daughters of Canaan. By doing this, God will turn away from his fierce wrath against us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.